Let's uh, pray. Dear Father, thank you for uh, all the things that have happened this week, uh, including, uh, to our surprise, after a meeting on Tuesday with our builder, the things happened straight away. Wow, we weren't expecting that. But we thank you for how we can be here today uh, on a stormy day, but we thank you that we still have the freedom to meet. I, I'm just thinking of my, uh, some of my friends in Queensland who, uh, who would have no church today uh, as they go, went into a sudden lockdown. And, and here we are, Lord, we have such freedom at the moment still to meet and to have fellowship. And thank you for that. And uh, we just ask now, uh, we always want to do that as we come to consider your word. Uh, Lord, who are we to, to make sense of this without your help? And we ask for your spirit to, to minister to us and guide us through this passage of scripture that has its challenges. And we ask that you would uh, help us and for your glory and for our sake that you would work in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Well, um, start off by uh, just sharing about human history. Human history. What do you think of human history? I reckon one of the things you can think of with human history, it's been dotted by lots of battles. What do you reckon? There's been battles galore. Isn't that right? And uh, you think about the battles between good and evil. The battles between one opposing force to another opposing force. And then I think of even last century, last century, you know, World War I, World War II, nearly World War III during the Cuban crisis. And there's it's been huge battles. And of course, if you're into watching movies, how many movies are built on that theme of battles, of good and evil, whether it be Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or some Marvel movie. It's just all there, isn't it? It seems to be part of our, um, our, our way of life. But there is a real battle, no movie, a final battle, a battle of all battles, the final showdown. And we read about that in Revelation 20 this morning. Did you pick up on that? There is actually a final battle before God brings into this world everlasting righteousness and peace. Praise his name. There is a final battle, a final judgment, and then it all ends. And I'm so uh, delighted to uh, look at this chapter, even though it's a bit challenging as well, before we get to the final two chapters, which are about the new creation and the glory of heaven. And I want to just flag a few things as I look at Revelation 20 with you. It is uh, somewhat a controversial passage. Uh, there's two reasons for it. In the second half of Revelation 20, we read about uh, the judgment of God. And I want to say to you today that there are more and more Christians who believe there is no judgment, that God is a loving God and there will be no judgment and there's definitely no eternal hell or lake of fire. And so this has become a controversial passage where people play down at what it says. I want you to be aware of that. There's a growing number of Christians heading in that direction. And you need to make up your mind what you're going to do. Listen to the popular view or to God. And the other thing that is a little bit controversial is the mention of the thousand years. And if you have read about this, you will know that there are three dominant views in the Christian faith called the premillennial, the postmillennial, and the amillennial views in regards to this truth. So um, I'll do my best to explain it to you. <laughs> so, and, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So, um, so as we consider Revelation 20, like every other part of the Bible, even though I have um, access to lots of com commentaries and sermons as I prepare, I, I just want to share this with you and you need to do the same. You always need to make sure that you humble yourself and you listen to what God's Spirit is saying. And even if you can't understand it right now, just keep praying and God will help you understand his truth. He's promised to do that, to lead us into all truth. So I have a, a view on this passage and I'll share it with you. Uh, but let's begin by reading Revelation 20, 1 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down into heaven, uh, from heaven, sorry, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. <coughs> All right. 
So the first thing that I, I want to pick up on is how the devil is mentioned. And just like in Revelation chapter 12, there's four descriptions given of him in verse 2. He's the dragon. That's meant to be uh, an image of, being, uh, of a frightening being. And he's the serpent of old. What's that about? Ha! Oh, that's the one who was in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Look at that being mentioned here. The serpent of old. And who else is he called? What else is he called? The devil and Satan. And what I find amazing when I, I, I look at this passage, the first thing that hits me is that an angel, let me emphasise that again, an angel from heaven comes down and binds the devil. Wow, shackles him. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? An angel. An angel. You understand what I'm saying? Because we know that the devil, he is the arch enemy of God. He is the prince of all the angels, but fell. He is very powerful. He is frightening in his power, but just an angel comes down from heaven and hot gets hold of him and throws him into the abyss. How can that be? Because the angel was operating on the authority of the king of kings. And whatever he says goes, whether he sends down an angel or not. I love that. This is just an angel, but he's operating under the power of Christ. And I want you to remind, be reminded of how, who Jesus is. Our Lord Jesus in Revelation 19 verse 16 in the previous chapter, he is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the supreme king and ruler over all creation, including the spiritual realm. And that's such a great thing to know. The risen Jesus, who humbled himself and was obedient to death on the cross, is the risen king, who is the king over all creation, over all the world, over all the satanic realm. And when it was time, bang, for the Satan to be bound, it happened. Because he's the king. I tell you what, when I think about these things, I am so glad that I'm on his side. Because he drew me to himself. I'm so glad my great saviour is the king. And we are part of him. Are you glad about that? Because yeah. to be on the other side, it's a worry. <laughs> it's, it's dangerous. How good it is to be on the Lord's side. So that's... Um, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That an angel comes down and, uh, and it has the power by Christ's authority to lay hold of the devil and to cast him into the abyss. And so then we have this thing in, this, in these three verses. We have this mention of a thousand years. A thousand years. What is this? Is this a literal time? Is it metaphoric? Uh, what is it? So I need to explain to you now um, these three different views called the uh, pre-millennial, the post-millennial, and the amillennial views of the thousand years. So Mitch has got a slide he's going to show. Here we go. So I, I just hope you can see it, otherwise we can print it off for you. So these are the three views. Because we need to work out when this occurs. So the first view, the pre-millennial view, is a view where Christ returns, he executes the wrath of God upon the world, and then after that, there's a thousand year, literal thousand year reign um, of Christ on the earth. And the devil, what's his state? Bound. He's restrained from doing his damage in the world. That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Good. The devil's gone. Okay, and then after that comes final judgment and then eternity. All right, the um, post millennial view is that we are in the church age at the moment and this will move into the millennial age. And, and what will happen is the gospel will have more and more influence upon the world. More and more people will become Christians. And there will be worldwide revival. And then Christ will return. And then there will be final judgment. And then there will be eternity. All right. And then the amillennial view. The amillennial view is that right now is the millennium. It's not a literal thousand years. This is the period of time of the church where Satan has been bound because of the gospel, because of Christ being raised from the dead. And so during this time, um, the millennial rule is happening, and then Christ will return, and then we'll have final judgment and eternity. All right, so take a pick. Which one? 
Okay, so there's another view. Another view is um, the pan millennial view. Has anyone heard about that one? Oh, yeah, that means we're going to just let things pan out and then we'll find out which one to pick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me say to you that the pan millennial view is um, an okay view because the millennial um, debate is not a salvation issue, issue. So it's not to be fought with dogmatism. It's not about salvation. But I also reckon we should try our best to work out which view could be correct. We have our Bibles, we have the Holy Spirit, we should be praying and asking, well, Lord, what do you reckon about these things? So I'm not a pan-millennialist. I'm tempted to be one, but no, I, I, I find myself having to look at the Scriptures and work things out. So what view do I have? I want to say to you that this view that I have is not the church's view. We've left it open for people to have different views. So this is a personal view. So I've oscillated to some degree over the years, but at the present time, I operate on the pre-millennial view. So that's the view that I hold to. And, and, um, and I'm going to just share reasons why. The reasons why I hold to the pre-millennial view, and if you have, don't have that view, that's fine. The reason I hold to the pre-millennial view is that according to my understanding of Jesus' teaching about the end times, about this period of time that we live in, I do not see what the post-millennial view teaches. What's that view? It teaches that there will be the, the gospel going out to all the world and more and more people being saved and there will be worldwide revival before Christ returns. Jesus' teaching does not tell me that. Jesus tells me the opposite. That as time goes on, there will be less and less believers. That there will be a great falling away. So let me read some of those verses to you. So I want to turn to Matthew chapter 24, 10 to 13. Oh man, I'd love it if there was worldwide revival, but I don't see it in the scriptures. Matthew 24, 10 to 13 says, At that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will, will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Get the picture? End times doesn't just mean the last few years before Jesus returns. It's talking about this whole period of time getting more intense. And you can just pick up in Jesus' words that there are going to be just very few who, who trust in Jesus. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, at the end of verse 8, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Wow! So you, you don't know, um, nothing in the scriptures to teach us of worldwide revival. That view is uh, brought, brought out because of some of the passages in the Old Testament, which I believe are translated wrongly, and that's why they believe in worldwide revival. Okay, but what about the amillennial view? The amillennial view is saying that, uh, that Christ is ruling now and that, um, and that Satan has been bound because of the preaching of the gospel and because of the resurrection of Jesus. And it all sounds great. But I don't hold to that view because I do not see Christ reigning in the sense of what it says in Revelation 20. I see Christ reigning in the sense that he's allowing the gospel to go out to the whole world. And he is reigning, he's always reigning, but he's also allowing the reign of humans. And there's heaps of free will being done at the moment. And I see the devil really active, like more active than ever, in conning the Western Christian world to become anti-Christian. Don't you see that? This is not, I can't see the amillennial view. I see Satan really having a time to hoodwink so many people, whether it's through evolution or whether it's through... Um, cultural Marxism, or whether it's through getting rid of Christianity, this curse, so that we might be free of it. That's, that's what's going on right now in our world. And so I see Satan really ruling and reigning and getting ready for his antichrist to be set up here on earth. So that's why I don't hold to the amillennial view. But if people do, that's fine. I think we need to have a reason for the views we have. And if you want to be a pan-millennialist, that's fine too. <laughs> All right. So with those thoughts, let us now look further into uh, Revelation chapter 20. So I'm going to read now verses 4 and 5. 
Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image had not, and had not received a mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. All right, so when I read those words, I get really excited. Why is that? Well, it's telling me, uh, holding to the pre-millennial view, that Christ is reigning, and he's reigning on earth with who? With us. With us. So all those um, who have died in Christ who have been martyred for the faith, they will be resurrected. All those who have died in Christ right through time, they're going to be resurrected. And those who are alive when Christ returns, they will be resurrected in the sense that their bodies will be transformed and changed in the twinkling of an eye at Christ's return. And we will be living on this earth, probably it sounds like around Jerusalem, around its surrounds, we'll be there living with Christ who's reigning on this earth. Wow, this is exciting for us. So Christ is reigning and we have been resurrected and we are reigning with him. And we'll, by the way, we, we're going to be living for that whole period of time because we have new bodies, glorious bodies, eternal bodies. Man, a thousand years, that's a long time. Okay, so that's the state of play. So that's how we'll be. And it says here, that we are part of the first resurrection. That's really important. The first resurrection. What's the first resurrection? The first resurrection is for all those who are in Christ. On the day Christ returns, we'll be resurrected. We're part of the first resurrection. How good is it to be part of the first resurrection? Excellent. Because you read verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Amen. The people of the first resurrection are the saved people. They are the people of Christ. And they will not only reign with Christ, but the second death has no power over them. What is the second death? The second death is condemnation and eternal punishment. That's the second death. For those who did not receive Jesus. And that has no power over us. Judgment has no power over us. We will not go to hell. We are saved. How blessed it is to be part of the first resurrection. To be part of Christ. And to be reigning with him for a thousand years. Praise the Lord. Now, just to, to do with uh, the view I hold to, the premillennial view, I also am intrigued, just to share very briefly, it seems to me that God, and I'll say that again, it seems to me that God has ordained, in terms of human history, seven millenniums. And God loves the number seven. And if you think about it, you can work it out yourself, it's not too hard. From the creation to the Christ coming and dying and rising again, how many millenniums? Four. Four millenniums. Pretty close, pretty accurate. Four. And then at the moment we are in the, the last two millenniums, from the resurrection of Christ to the return of Christ, we're getting close to the second end of the second millennium. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me at all if as we come to this end of the second millennium, we come into the seventh millennium and that's the reign of Christ. Because God is a master mathematician and has it all worked out. Imagine seeing his calendar. Nothing ever changes. There it is. Right through. He has known the end from the beginning. And when we have a book like Revelation, he's just telling us what he knows already. It's all going to happen like this. I love those great pictures of God, the great big over overviews of our God and his plans. So, so what do you think, eh? Re Revelation 24 to 6 is an exciting time when, when we will come alive if we've died in Christ or if we were alive when Christ came. We're going to be here on this earth 
Reign with Christ, amen and amen. And not just Christ in heaven, but he will be on earth. Okay, let's now look at these last four verses of Revelation 20, starting at verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Okay, so Satan has not been influential in the world. He's been in the abyss and he's going to be released. Notice in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, it says, After these things he must be released for a short time. The word must there indicates to us God's will. God has decreed, Christ has decreed that even though Satan will be bound for this time, God has decreed that he will be released for a short time. Okay, let's see what's going to happen. So he'll come out of his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. And the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now I don't know if you're confused here. You need to be aware that during this time of the reign of Christ, the nations will still be there. Because God didn't wipe out every human being. Even though lots of people died during the time of, the, of, of Christ coming and, and judgment coming upon the earth, many still live. And they will be living. They won't be living like us. They will have their natural cycle of living and dying. And, and the nations will be there and God's people will be on earth with Christ. It's an amazing time. But look what happens. The, the devil is released and the nations have a choice to make. And what choice do they make? They line themselves up with the devil. He goes out, he deceives them, and he brings them back into his reign, and then the devil, during his short time, will bring the nations of the world, the armies of the world, against God's holy people. And there will be this massive battle, the final battle, the final showdown. Verse 9, And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. That is the final showdown, the final battle, the battle of all battles. What happens? Well, they come, this great number that cannot be counted. They will come and they will oppose Christ and his people. We believe this is Armageddon. It's a broad plain. They come to the outskirts of Jerusalem and it surrounds where God's holy people are. And they will come to destroy Christ who is on earth and to destroy God's people. But who do they think they're dealing with? They have no idea. The devil has blinded their eyes to the reality of Christ and the great King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great creator of heaven and earth, the one who conquered the grave, shall arise for his people and destroy the enemies and the armies of Satan. Just like that. That's how it's going to be. We are on the victory side because of Christ. And how sad, how sad that the people of the world during that time, the nations, still do not recognise who Jesus is. They side with the devil rather than with Christ. That's sad. That's really sad. And then to finish off, verse 10 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And at Christ's return, we have the beast and the false prophet thrown into hell, uh, or the lake of fire. The beast is the uh, antichrist. And the false prophet is his uh, false prophet. And the third one to be thrown into hell is the devil. There's no one in hell until the beast and the false prophet are thrown there. And then the devil is thrown there. And next week, God willing, we'll look at the next part where we will have the most saddest passage of all, where humans will be judged by God and they will be sent to that same place as well. People argue today that this place hell is not real. Uh, God was only speaking metaphorically. Uh, but that's not how the Bible reads. Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else. 
who knew the reality of it. He'll be the one who judges. And you notice that even here in verse 10, it has some very striking and challenging things about it. The lake of fire, it says in verse 10, is full of brimstone. It's a place where, where people will be tormented day and night forever and ever. No wonder we have an urgency to share the gospel with people around us. But as I conclude this morning, I look at all this and I believe it with all my heart, this is exactly what will happen because God's word is true. And so what is the smart thing to do? The smart thing to do is be in Jesus. Right now, repent of your sins and turn to Jesus. Trust in him. He's our saviour. But he also will bring judgment upon all those who are outside of him. And as I, I think about these things, I, I just sense how we I live in a world where so many people have just no regard for Jesus, they have no idea about all these things. And I, I just ask and pray that everyone here this morning, we might really know Jesus. How do you know Jesus? Repent of your sins and receive him as your Lord and Saviour. And then whether you die now or whether Christ returns, you're, you're, it's all good because you're saved. You're forgiven. You will not be judged. You'll be with the Lord forever. And you'll reign with Christ on earth and then after this you'll be on a new earth forever and ever enjoying eternal righteousness and eternal peace. And this is it. If I would summarise to you life, what's life all about? To me, even reading verses 7 to 10, Life has always been a test. Even in those last verses we read, there's a test. The devil will be released to test us again. God will use him to test us. Who do we side with? Do we side with the world or do we side with Christ? That's it. Do you realise that's what life is? It's not like just living it here and having fun and then seeing where you go after this life. It's a test. Are you going to be loyal to Christ who gave his life for you and shed his blood to save you? Or are you going to live for this world? That's the test. And the test is seen again right at the end before the final showdown. Which side will you choose? I choose Jesus. He's the king. He's the lover of my soul. He saved me. I give my life to him. And I trust you will do the same too. We're going to sing together a song, a triumphant song about our Lord Jesus, who is the King. Rejoice, the Lord is King. So let's stand and sing this together.
We've got everything to rejoice about. We honestly do. This world's going down. It's a mess out there. It's going to get worse. But if we belong to Jesus, it's well with our soul because the Lord is King. I hope you're excited about that. You don't get discouraged and forlorn, but you remember who you belong to because of his love, calling you to himself and you responding to him. Amen. Because of him, we're going to live forever. It's all good. The Lord's in control. Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Dear Father, thank you for this great revelation that we have been given, the last book of the Bible, to explain to us so well, even if we get a bit confused about some of it, we thank you that we can make sense of the main thrust of it, and that is that your son is the one who's going to rule and reign, and, and we are able to be part of him and his people if we would give ourselves to him even today. So I ask that you would help us to make sure, Lord, we are yours, that we have turned from our own ways and that we have given our life to Jesus, your son. And, and if we've done that, praise your name. And Lord, I just ask that, in the days that we live in, we wouldn't be unsettled and shaken because you're our king, your son. And I pray that you would help us to indeed rejoice through all the things that we're going through in this world, that we'll be able to see beyond the things of this world to what's to come. And what's to come is glorious for us. Lord, I, I just love the fact that Jesus, the one we speak of, the great king of kings, is also the one who died in our place. It's just beyond comprehension that the one so, so mighty should allow evil people to kill him, to put him to death in the most meanest way. And yet he did that to bring about our salvation so that we could be part of him. What a saviour. What a love that he should do that for us. We are so thankful, Father, for your son, who is both our saviour and our king. And I just ask that you'd also speak to anyone here today who isn't there yet, that you would help them to cross over and to leave this world behind, to leave their own life behind, and that they would give themselves fully to Jesus. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>